Good morning, afternoon or evening to everybody joining us today. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to get started in just a moment. Um, and I wanted to just let people know that we will be recording this session um, so that anybody can look back on this at a later time. Uh, so do keep that in mind in terms of your levels of participation. Uh, we won't be reading out the names of anybody who pops questions in the chat and the chat itself is not recorded in the recording itself. Um, so if you wish to stay anonymous, uh, that's perfectly fine. And let's get started. Oh, the other thing um, to bear in mind is if you do have any questions at any point throughout, uh, then please do pop those in the chat and we can get to your questions throughout today's webinar. So welcome uh, as we talk about coping with involuntary childlessness. My name is Dr. Kieran Hillier and I will be uh, turning on my video and introducing myself to all of you properly in a moment. But what I would like to do first is introduce our two panelists uh, with our next two slides. And then I'll be turning off the slides so you can see the three of us on your screens. So first I wanna introduce Sarah Roberts. So Sarah is a grief therapist and founder of The Empty Cradle, which is a specialist counselling service for involuntary childless women. Sarah is also completing her master's in social work, focusing on women's grief and the transition to permanent involuntary childlessness. If you do wanna reach out to Sarah, then uh, feel free to do so on her website, uh, the link of which is posted there. So we're very excited to be talking with Sarah and now I wanna introduce you to our other panelist. Uh, who's Michael? So Michael Hughes is one half of a childless marriage uh, and one third of the Full Stop podcast, which aims to highlight uh, the issues experienced by the childless community, as well as give hope as they accept um, their potential future of um, continuing in their lives without children. He blogs uh, on the Married and Childless website on the male childless experience um, and is one of the founders of the Clan of Brothers, uh, which is available on Facebook, a safe virtual space for childless men. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides and I'm going to turn on my video. So my name is Dr. Kieran Hillier and I'm a psychologist at Open Minds uh, Psychiatrist Counseling and Neuroscience Centre, uh, which is here in Dubai. And I'm also working as an assistant professor of psychology at Harriet Watt University, uh, Dubai campus. So in terms of uh, this particular topic and what got me very interested about exploring it uh, for our audience here in the UAE and in the wider community um, is that when I read about uh, Michael and Sarah on an ABC article, so ABC, for those of you who are not Australian, um, myself, Sarah and Michael are all Australian. <laughs> so the ABC is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, which is a government funded uh, media outlet. And so I read about the two of them on a news article that was posted online. Uh, and I thought that this is a topic that really we don't get much of an opportunity to talk about here in the UAE. Um, and in fact, many people might not even be familiar with the terms in voluntary <laughs> childlessness. Uh, or <laughs> I'm going to mute Mandy. There we go. Um, yeah, people might not be familiar with the term involuntary childlessness or the term childless not by choice. Uh, and so the goal of today is to get this conversation going. Um, and so I was very happy to hear back from Sarah and Michael that they were both keen um, to have this discussion and share both their personal experiences, their own lived experiences, as well as their professional side um, in terms of the different services and resources that they offer to the wider community. So uh, I'm going to ask Sarah and Michael to turn on their cameras and their mics so we can get the conversation started. Thank you uh, so much to the two of you for joining us today. I know it is later in the day and it is a Sunday evening for the two of you. So while it's our weekday, it's your weekend. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thank, you, given, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about this. And the really, the, the, realistically, this is when we talk about this in our spare time. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Awesome. So um, in terms of getting the ball rolling, and certainly, as I mentioned before, if anyone does have questions, feel free to pop those in the chat. Um, I mean, I've given both of you an introduction. I, I never think I can really quite do justice um, in terms of the work that people do in these short intros. Um, but it would be great uh, for the sake of the audience if each of you could just give a little bit more detail about who you are um, and why this is such an important topic for the two of you. Um, so who would like to go first? Sarah, please. <laughs> I love that when we volunteer Thank another you. person. <laughs> Very generous. Um, I guess I just wanted to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the Brisbane region, the Yagara and the Turrbal people, um, who are the traditional Aboriginal owners of the lands uh, that I am uh, living in and that I am coming to you from today. Just wanted to recognise their connection to land, sea and culture and to pay respects to their elders and ancestors past, present and future. So I just want to start there. Um, look, my story, like lots of our stories around this because um, fertility and having children or not having children is part of the really big stuff of life. It's, it's some of the really big decisions that, that we make during our lifetimes. And my story, to be honest, actually really starts back with my grandmothers. So my grandmothers, um, both of them had children in their late 30s and their early 40s. So during uh, my lifetime, from being a very young woman, being a mother was always really important to me. Um, I knew that it was something that I really wanted in my future, I lived through my my teens, my twenties, and and even at the start of my thirties, I knew it was a really important thing for me. What happened for me was that I grew up in suburban Brisbane. Um, I grew up in a white middle class family. Um, we um, came and landed in Australia in, in the eighteen thirties, and so we were we were part of the the, the early colonising from Northern Ireland and also from from Scotland. And uh, my mother, when she was growing up, she, um, she was part of the early, um, I guess, the second generation of, of, um, of feminists, where when she was a young woman, she did very well in high school, but she came from a family where her father was returning from, from World War II. And um, they basically lived in a very tiny, small town. He was a teacher and uh, they didn't have a lot of money. Um, so there was her and her brother and um, she was told that if she didn't get a scholarship to university that she wouldn't be able to go, they couldn't afford to send her. And back in, in that day when she went and did nursing, um, so she did more of an apprenticeship where she was earning an income and met my father. And back in the day then, once women got married or had children, um, they weren't able to continue with their education. So I grew up in a family, I had four sisters um, and one brother. Um, and for us in our family, uh, it was a very strong um, part of our family culture for young women to get educated, um, to make our way in the world, to have a level of independence. Um, certainly we were starting to realise that, that you couldn't necessarily rely on that traditional finding a provider and, and uh, being in that traditional role. But also we had ambitions and things that we wanted to achieve in the world as well. And it's often the story for women that it's often that balance between um, personal ambition and what is it that we're wanting to achieve and um, then, you know, romance and motherhood and how do, you, how do we weave all of that together? It becomes sometimes a very complex tapestry. And particularly when it doesn't go very well, um, Many of the women that I work with or know um, often have been educated. They're wanting to establish their careers. They're wanting to maybe establish a financial asset base. And a lot of those can actually be quite maternal decisions where they're decisions about these are the circumstances in which I would like to have children. And it can be really tricky when, when those, as time is marching on and when those things aren't lining up clearly for us. So I met my um, now husband in my early 30s um, and we, I went and actually saw a gynaecologist when I was 34 and uh, I, I saw her for something else and, and she sat me down and she said, 
so are you planning to have kids? And I said, oh, yeah, one day it's important. You know, at that point, I hadn't really claimed how important motherhood was to me. And she said to me at 34, she said, you don't have time to stuff around with this. You need to be getting yourself some really clear information and making some clear decisions because there's no guarantees that once you're getting to 35 onwards that this is going to happen easily for you. So me being me, I still took a little bit more time to make that decision. And then by about 35, 36, we, we started to try for children. Um, and then at about 37, realised it wasn't happening. Um, we're clearly not really rapid decision makers. Um, and so we went into our, our doctor, our general practitioner. Um, there were some issues in terms of our physical health. Um, and certainly my age wasn't helping. So we then went into fertility treatment and I went through IUIs, um, IVF, right through, um, and I did my last IVF cycle at 45. So, and that is, you know, that's less than, you know, you're probably more likely to win the lottery maybe than have, <laughs> than have, than be successful. No, but that's probably not quite right. But um, it really was, I let the clock run down on my fertility and I wanted to do everything that I possibly could to make sure that it happened. Um, and sadly for us, uh, it didn't happen. And uh, we conceived and lost 12 children. And uh, sadly for us, we then, um, I guess what happened for me was that I was really struck by this incredible deep grief. Um, and really it was, it felt like uh, an annihilation of my identity and my sense of what my life was going to be moving forward. Um, I reached out for support. I went and saw a number of, of counsellors and therapists, um, found the responses that I got quite problematic. Um, and uh, what I then did is I then um, really relied to some extent on my own resources because my background was, was in counselling and community work. Um, so I went back and did a lot of study, um, really got myself... Um, uh, equipped uh, in terms of understanding grief and uh, now work as a grief therapist supporting women who uh, have a similar story to mine where they deeply wanted to be mothers. They might have even not been sure for a period of time, but when it got to the point where it didn't happen for them, um, where they're needing some support through the grief and then looking at what does the second half of life look for them now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my story mm -hmm. so it's so lovely to be here and thank you so much Kieran for creating this space it's it's really groundbreaking so thank you yeah. and thank you Sarah for sharing that um what about you Michael um I understand your experience is uh somewhat different to Sarah's but um yeah tell us about about yourself and why you think you're doing the work that you're doing Okay, um, I'll leave the why to a bit later on because it will make. Mm -hmm. hopefully it'll make sense. So mm -hmm. Vicky and I, my wife, have known each other since we were about 16 or 17. And um, she was always, uh, she's a very maternal woman. So that was her dream. I want to be a mother. And so I was from a family that didn't see that um, as important uh, as getting yourself established. Mm -hmm. so, but in the end, we come to a nice happy medium and we were sort of 25, 26, 27, because it's a long time ago now. <laughs> but <laughs> once we got married, we decided to try for a family. Now, some years before this, the doctors had said to Vicky, look, you're going to need some help. She'd had some issues uh, um, with the reproductive system, and but it never really made sense. It just, yeah, what does that mean? You know, at, at, now I realise that you know, in the twenties, you just you're oblivious to most things. Well, I was, we were. <laughs> so um, you're invincible in your twenties. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is very true, and and that actually comes up a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, 
we went through the whole gamut, just like Sarah did, of the the rep of the um, fertility treatments. I won't bore you with the gory details, but let's just say that um, we got to our late thirties, so we tried for fifteen years to have children, and we got to our late thirties. And we, we looked at each other one day after another failure and just went, how long, how, how, how are we going to, are we going to keep doing this? When are we going to stop? And we realized that in the last 10 years, we hadn't had a holiday because we'd all, we'd used all our holiday time around fertility treatments mm -hmm. and uh, we were depressed. And so we decided to stop and we spent a considerable amount of money going around the world. Uh, and what that did was it took us away from all the baggage of here, mm -hmm. of all that emotional trying for children thing and everything was brand new and all these wonderful experiences we had. And really, um, it, it really highlighted how different our life should be the contrast made us realize how unhappy we were. Mm. So <laughs> the flip side of that was we had such a good time. We we're in such a good mood when we got back. My wife said, should we try again? Mm. Oh, okay. So we was about 40 by this time and, and we did. And it was the only time that it worked. And it was on her birthday that they said, the six weeks was up and they said, yeah, it, you know, it's worked. And it was on the following Father's Day, which is, so her birthday's in August and it was late September, I think it is, that we found out that she miscarried. And um, yeah, that was a very, very traumatic time for us because you know, obviously the, the clock had been ticking and... Um, we had to make a decision to draw the line in the sand and it took me to be crying on our lounge going, I can't take this anymore to, for that to happen because the emotional roller coaster that this takes you on is, is horrific. Now for those who it was successful, they will say the opposite, but for those who aren't successful is horrific. And as, as Sarah said, it's a deep grief. Uh, and, each one of those dips got deeper and deeper and deeper. And so, yeah, we decided to draw a line in the sand. And it took us 10 years to sort of, I guess, say, come good, accept that. Um, so it wasn't until, yeah, late, 90, uh, late 40s, early 50s that we sort of felt in a good place. Yeah. And so well, one of the things we felt, um, that the whole system lacked was the IVF process just sets you adrift once you've once you've sort of finished with it. Mm -hmm. So there's no support. So you're just set adrift. And many people will tell you this. Yeah. And what do you do? Where do you go? We found a group online of uh, of childless people that we joined, and that really opened the world up to us. Uh, in terms of firstly finding people who understood us it, you know we were able to normalize how we felt we found that our story and, and the way that we grieved and and try and try to get over that I shouldn't say get over that I should say manage that um, uh, was yeah again okay, normalized and it was in 2018 uh, my wife and I had a chance to go to the UK and um, some of the people in our online group, uh, a lot of them from the UK, and they said, oh, there's an event going on in Shepherd's Bush. It's called Fertility Fest. And they, they, it's run by Jessica Hepburn. And it's sort of a, it's a, a festival of fertility around uh, using the arts. And uh, there's a day there for infertility. So I said to my wife, look, we're here in the UK at the right time. Let's go, because there's some of the other people we know or know of are going. And, and we went. After, after she looked at me and went, are you sure? What, what is this fertility? Seriously? And um, so we had a, a really interesting time. And 
in the foyer afterwards, everyone's having a few drinks and, and getting to know each other. And it, it, that's when the magic really happened, I guess you could say, in, in the way that um, we built connections. And we'd had a bit to drink and we were looking for something to eat. So after, once they closed the foyer, we went looking for something to eat. And I remember thinking, where's, where's Vicky? Where is she? And behind, I turn around, and there she is in a group of three or four women, all hugging together, crying. And potentially, I might do that in a minute because it always makes me emotional. But, and I said, You're okay. And she said, Michael, this is the first time I've felt like I've belonged somewhere. Mm-hmm. And because um, one of the other things we probably haven't mentioned yet, but the infertility journey is extremely socially isolating. And it was that moment that was the catalyst for me to to do what I do, because if if I can introduce other people to finding that place they feel they belong, then my work is done. Amazing. So it sounds like that both of you saw that there was a um, a gap in terms of the the services and the resources uh, that were being made available. Um, And Sarah, you made an earlier comment about that some of the responses that you got from therapists was quite problematic um, in a way. And Michael, you mentioned the very isolated and um, procedure. And then if it doesn't happen, then you kind of, okay, um, go and do your own thing. Um, Sarah, did you want to expand on that when you say like there was uh, stuff that was problematic and I guess that could be from the professional services but also did either of you find you know in terms of well-meaning friends and family might be saying stuff that with the best of intentions but was actually not helping or actively making things worse uh, for your experience yeah the thing that's interesting about our experience is that uh, certainly in Australia, a good 80% of people uh, become parents. And so they um, probably around seven to 9% of people are fairly clear that they definitely don't want children. Um, And it leaves kind of, you know, maybe 13, 15% of people who end up who are childless and hasn't been their choice. So it's really important to start with to say there's some people who really choose not to have children. There's others who choose to be parents and can find it a real struggle um, or or find it, you know, really satisfying. Um, And usually a lot of both. Mm -hmm. Um, What happens for us is that uh, our experience intersects with some really heavy taboo topics. Um, One of them is around sex and sexuality and fertility and conception and certainly within my cultural context uh, you don't really talk about that until you get to 12 weeks and then there's the announcement so people don't necessarily talk too much mm-hmm. about when they're thinking about having children or when they're they're going through the process of conceiving um, also then when um, when things start to to go wrong or, or there might be some problems there can be a sense of shame what's wrong with me um a lot of internal um shame or blame that's happening um Mm -hmm. and a sense of okay i'm just putting myself through this in order to to have a child and the expectation often will be that 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 having a child is really important so one of the things that's really important for people is that how it impacts on people will depend on their orientation to motherhood. So for some people, it's absolutely clear from a really young age that they want to have children or to not have children. Mm. Um, And then for a lot of people, it's very uh, impacted on, it's not quite as clear, it might change over time and it's very impacted by circumstances. So opportunities of being in um, the right relationship. So lots of people end up um, childless through circumstance. They estimate possibly around 80% of people who are who were childless are through um, circumstance and that means that they may not have met a suitable partner during their fertile years Um, there might have been a whole you know a range of contextual factors that meant that that things didn't fall into place 
um, in order for them to, to have children in the circumstances that they wanted to. What's happened in, particularly what's happened in, in, in psychology and really particularly in developmental psychology, um, but also in um, therapy and counselling has been that there has been a very limited amount of research um, which really understands what is the experience like for people who aren't able to have children, but particularly what happens to them after the fertility journey is over. So what is that grief, what's that transition process like? All of us and therapists included, medical staff, uh, therapists are, are what we would call living in very much um, pronatalist cultural context, where the assumption is that to be an adult person, particularly to be a, a woman, often it can be considered that womanhood and motherhood are very closely linked to each other. And so it's assumed perhaps that you're not an adult woman until you've had children. Um, also, um, where it's assumed that, that people become parents. And so what I've found from my personal experience, but also my clinical experience is that um, being a childless person is quite a different way of being in the world than it is from being a mother or even being somebody who's chosen not to have children. Um, and what happens is for people where they're experiencing significant grief, even in very social contexts, um, a really big question that, that many of us struggle with is, you'll be standing at a cocktail party and it'll be, do you have kids? And often that person's just asking in a very social kind of way, or they might say, how many kids do you have? Or they then might even go on to go, why don't you have kids? And what happens is that person is wanting to have a very social, they're looking for a point of connection. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not intended in, in a way that's meant to bring up some really big feelings. But often for us, we're actually holding on to some really difficult emotions and complex emotions around having children. Mm. Um, then there can be, um, it can be assumed that you never wanted them. And that's particularly the case for, certainly for gay and lesbian um, um, and gender diverse people that, that we've worked with, that it could be assumed that because you're gay that you didn't want to be a parent. Um, during the fertile years, it can be a lot of advice giving. So have you tried, just relax, kind of advice mm. giving that often is actually given from a perspective, sometimes for someone who maybe doesn't understand how complex the fertility journey can be. Mm -hmm. And you can guarantee that if somebody is trying to have children and it's not working, they will be doing a lot of thinking, problem solving. They'll be really trying to work it out. Another really painful one can be... Um, just adopt there's plenty of unwanted children out there just just you know go and adopt certainly in my context adoption wasn't an option for for personal reasons it wasn't an option but also um it's very difficult to adopt in australia and it's mm. very complex um the other thing about adoption is that adoption can start with an unwanted pregnancy and it can also um impact on people who are who are adopted and who experience adoption mm. and I guess what I wanted to say about adoption is that adoption is like a calling it's a path to parenthood that people are called to do and it's really important and it's an equally valid pathway to parenthood and families that are formed through adoption are as solid and beautiful as families formed through biological um, um, you know parenting but it's a way of treating adoption as a second prize mm. for being infertile. It's like your plan B. Your plan B. So you, mm. you couldn't have a biological family. So that's the gold standard. So why don't you adopt? So it's actually quite disrespectful to mm. adoptive families in, in that respect. Um, and so the other thing might be, um, you know, thank God it's not B, a lot of pitying responses, a lot of, um, uh, you know, as a mother, uh, so for example, uh, we might be in workplaces and, and people will say things like there might be something terrible that's happened to a child and someone will say, well, as a mother, you know, as if they have a particular monopoly on empathy mm -hmm. um, or as a mother, you know, you couldn't possibly understand or know love. And, and um, then there can be the flip side of it is where, where people might be really dismissive of our lives and not very curious. So, mm -hmm. so if we say, you know, do you have kids and we say no, like the that might be the end of the conversation. It might not be, oh, well, have you got significant 
have you got any other significant relationships or, or children in your life, like might be mm. nieces or nephews or those sorts of things? It could also be glamorizing our life. So people kind of assume that that me at in my early 50s is the same as the 25-year-old who was going to nightclubs and drinking, and they'll go, you know, you get to lie in, you get to you dodged a bullet, mm. um, aren't you lucky? Then it can be things like, you shouldn't bring the children into the world because of climate change. Mm. And that one's a particularly painful one because, yes, climate change is an issue and every person needs to, to be concerned about it, whether you're a parent or not a parent. But the thing about climate change is that climate change actually requires large-scale government responses. Me having or not having a baby is actually not really going to impact on saving the Amazon, mm -hmm. which is the kind of change that needs to happen. Um, the other thing about climate change is the climate change is around consumption rather than being about the number of people. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's very much about are we living in ways that are sustainable? Are we living in ways that are in harmony with the environment? Um, and, look, those comments can happen in workplaces. They can happen internally to ourselves they can happen in social spaces they can happen in families and so um what i would say is what we do need is how are you doing yeah. you know levels of empathy um how are you going what do you need um and just being able to 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 start a conversation if the conversation starts from a place of respect which is like i understand that that's a really you know, you've been through something really significant. Um, and then it might be about, well, what are the important things in your life? Um, mm -hmm. What are the things that are really important to you? And let's let's have opportunities to talk about those things and, and create inclusion so that we actually feel um, included rather than kind of stigmatised and devalued and, and shamed as a result of our, our childlessness. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, what about you, Michael? Um, and I imagine the, the experience of, and that's something that you've focused a lot on is, you know, the male experience of childlessness. Um, has your experiences been similar to Sarah's in terms of the types of questions or um, suggestions of advice or stuff um, that's come up for you or has it been quite different? Um, not really. It's, um suggestions of advice are always given um i won't i won't say some of them because i worked in a very male dominated uh, environment many years ago so probably not appropriate for this but um yeah it's what i want to say is that it's like the adoption thing oh you can just adopt mm -hmm. or have you tried this and what i want to say to people is it is the most important thing that we focused on for many, many years. Don't you think we tried every single thing? Mm -hmm. yeah, so it, it's very quite belittling to think that that they didn't think of this, that, mm -hmm. that, that you would have tried everything. Um, and yeah, the adoption piece that is, is really, really difficult. Uh, in World Childless Week, there was a fantastic uh, a webinar on just this subject. Mm -hmm. And it really delved into how complex the the whole adoption thing is. Um, like we said, it's not easy here, um, and you would probably um, be looking at a child that had special needs. And so that again levels of complexity. Mm. Uh, but one of the other things I want to say is that there's a massive paradigm shift for people with children to try and um, understand us because in our world, every single occasion that let's say the, the, the parents would have that is of a celebration is a trigger of grief for us. So uh, of course, births and birthdays, uh, Christmases, um, and some people manage that really well. But there are some people in our community that just that find it extremely hard to manage. And so it it really takes that massive paradigm shift to try and understand us, if you will. We were very lucky 
in that we had a therapist um, who had lost us a daughter and had lost her husband. And so she understood grief and, and we were very, very lucky. But Sarah Lawrence, who I do the podcast with, she speaks of some very inappropriate um, responses from therapists that she's visited mm -hmm. in her time. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, but for, for, a, for a guy, I guess, I guess it's just, as I alluded to earlier, you know, we felt bulletproof. In those years when you're struggling to become pregnant, you, you are sort of, you've got a bulletproof vest on, so to speak. You're, you're just trying to move, keep moving forward, keep moving forward. And you let things like that um, just bounce off, if you will. Because that's how you see, as a man, that's how you see your role in this, is to... Is, is to just just be strong, move forward, and don't let you know, don't let things affect you. And it's not until you get older, like me, at fifty four, and that that strength um, and that fortitude has waned somewhat, and it now starts to affect me. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, it's a, a very different experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, reflecting off what each of you say, it sounds like people struggle you know when when they're dealing with someone um and you're interacting with someone where both of you have talked about you know feelings of grief and trauma and shame and annihilation of identity uh and so a lot of people get really uncomfortable around those types of emotions and so the the goal is like let me like fix it or lighten the mood with some comment or something um but uh, in terms of what you found most useful then, um, either in regards to these communities that both of you have talked about or at a more professional services level, um, what has helped you in deal with those really intense, difficult emotions that both of you have talked about? Would you like to go first, Sarah? <laughs> There's Michael volunteering someone else again. <laughs> I mean, I'm quite happy to go first. But... Uh, Sarah, you're still muted. <laughs> it's got to happen. It's got to happen at least. At least <laughs> it's happened to someone else apart from me. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Um, some of my suggestions would be it would depend where you're at in your journey. So for people who are unsure if they want to become parents or fairly early on, um, I, would, I would suggest people have a think about their relationship and their values around being a parent and whether it's something that's important in their life. Um, one of the things that I listened to recently I was listening to um, some researchers about this and they said really fertility actually peaks at 24 which is so young I mean when you think back to where what you were doing at 24 mm -hmm. it's just like oh my goodness so the first thing would be to have a really even if you're not sure if you're if you're uncertain you're ambivalent like a lot of us for a really long time felt quite ambivalent about having children the first thing I would say is to get really well educated about your fertility and about the fertility process. So it may be that at 28 or 30, you're not quite sure where you're unpartnered, but that is probably going to be a really good time to really consider um, having your eggs frozen. And, and you know, um, the biggest issue for female fertility is egg quality. Mm -hmm. Is you know it it starts to decrease, I think, at 24 from, from what I was hearing them say. And by 35, it really does start to decline. Um, and so one of the really important things I've noticed, particularly for women, particularly in their 20s, is that it often can be a real challenge to actually claim the importance of motherhood in their lives. And then it's about saying, okay, if it's important to really have a think about the circumstances, um, the resources that you have to get informed with information and then to have a look at how does how do the actions of my life align with this being a priority. 
Um, and look, this is a really challenging conversation and the earlier you have it with yourself or your partner or to really think about that, um, the better it is, I think, to really have a think through what does this look like. Um, then what I would say during fertility treatment, and I would actually also say the transition to non-parenthood too, too, is that one of the things that happens in fertility treatment is people think that it's all about the body. They just think if I, you know, if I have, if I catch the ovulation, if I, you know, if I do this, if I, and they really focus on the physical. Mm -hmm. And I would say, I would say the job of the medical team, the job of the resources of the medical team, their job is 90% looking at the physical side of it and to get really good diagnostic information, to get re to investigate early as soon as possible, particularly around things like endometriosis um, that often is a sleeper that doesn't get diagnosed and can really impact on infertility, PCOS, to get all of that stuff investigated as soon as, as you can once you start to embark on, on fertility treatment. Um, then also uh, the other thing I would then say is that from the perspective of being a patient in fertility is that I would say that 90% of it is a head game. So I say from, from the perspective of being a patient, it's 90% looking after your psychological health and well-being, irregardless of where it ends. So it may end in parenthood, it may end in non-parenthood. And the aim of the game for you is to absolutely look after your, your health, your general health and lifestyle, but to actually realise that, that you're actually not in control of whether it's going to happen or not. And how are you going to navigate that uncertainty? And what skills and resources do you need to get you through and live through those years and really look after your psychological health. And that's what I would say is the biggest priority during fertility treatment. Then as it's coming to an end is then about um, really then linking with continuing that psychological health and realizing that if grief is starting to happen is then really get informed about what grief is. Um, and the first thing is to really have a look at your relationship with yourself um, and really have a look at we're very susceptible to, to shame, to isolation, to a sense of being unworthy. Um, so that is very much about, about learning the skills of how to grieve and learning the skills of how to be in good relationship with yourself. Um, and that's where a therapist can come in and really help you to do that. The other thing I would suggest is very much about creating sanctuary in your life, whether it's psychological, whether it's physical boundaries, really planning through and saying, how am I actually going to care for myself? What are the things that are really pushing my buttons now? Because with the grieving, often there'll be a very acute phase of grieving, then there'll be a slightly longer term grief. And then the grief can actually become, there's two ways the grief can end. One of them can be what Freud would call decathexis or the letting go, where you actually, you go through the grief, you've released it and you've kind of moved on and it's not as much a feature of your life. The second way that grief can happen can be, it can turn into a more chronic lifelong grief, which is an ongoing living loss, uh, which is what Michael described, which is that, uh, you know, the babies arrive and then the first day of school photos and then, you know, the, the, the teenage years or then there's the school or there's the university or there's the grandkids arriving and what actually happens is that for somebody living with that lifelong chronic grief and what we actually call that is there's a um, term for it called chronic sorrow and it's it's where the life you had hoped or expected the life you you expected it to be is different from the life that you're actually living mm -hmm. and so it's where it's that long-term grief um and look that can be a real shifting sands but it also it's a fairly low level in the sense that you're still able to function in the world but it's it's a grief that gets triggered up you've got all those tools of mindfulness and self-compassion and you tend to those emotions you lean into those feelings you allow those feelings to be processed through and what you do is when you're grieving it's actually not when you're in grief that you can see how far you've come it's when you look back and you go oh in the past, somebody might have asked me if I have kids and it would have really upset me. Whereas two years later, I've been tending to my grief and looking after myself and caring to myself. 
and now I'm kind of okay with it. Like they can ask me that and I can say, no, I don't. And, you know, sadly it didn't happen for us. And then that's it. And then I can move on. So it's through the looking backwards that you can really kind of get a sense of measuring and, and getting a sense of grief. The other thing I'd say about grief, and this is the work of um, Warden's work around the difference between grief counselling and grief therapy. So grief counselling, um, so when you think about grief, grief is like a river that flows. And it's um, what we do is it's, it's a fairly natural psychological process. So it's not considered a mental health disorder in any way. Mm -hmm. However, complicated grief has just been added into the diagnostic manual. And what that's about is grief counselling is very much about companioning. So it's very much about sitting in the rubble, being with that person, empathy, support, I'm here, I'm listening. Like, what do you need in being with that person? Grief therapy is if you think of that river and you think about where is it dammed, where are the crossings, where is it blocked, what stops the flow of that, that river happening? And so grief mm -hmm. therapy can actually be about um, tending to those things that are stopping the grief process from from flowing and so of course a really big uh block will be trauma so so if there's trauma happening in somebody's life tending to the trauma first creating emotional safety which then allows that person then to to move into a grieving space um yeah i guess the other thing i just wanted to say as well is that um it's not all doom and gloom there's some really lovely things about about um that process and who I've become as a result of living through that process, the person I am in the world now mm -hmm. is so much more interesting, so much more emotionally accessible, so much, you know, I'm, I'm living a life that is rich and meaningful and I have a lot to contribute to the community. And so, so it's, it's not all doom and gloom and disaster if, if parenthood doesn't happen for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and look, the last thing I'd say, which we touched on earlier, is how important it is to reach out to other people who get it, people who've lived through your experience, who understand and can say, me too, like what you're experiencing is normal. I've been through that. It's really tough. And they're the people that will understand that five years, 10 years later, if grief comes up, you know, if it's triggered up, they will get it and they will understand and they can hold that space for you. Um, the other thing is that childless people make really good, reliable friends. Like, yeah, you're very, very lucky if you've got if you've got friends who, who are childless um, because they'll make you a priority in their life, which is really, really lovely. That's a lovely note to end on, Rosia. Thank you. Uh, what about you, Michael? What have you found most helpful um, on your journey? Um, as a man, I think what was really helpful for me was one, the blog, because I wasn't really sure how I felt about it all back, in, you know, um, 2016, 15, 14, when we sort of realised that, you know, child's, children wouldn't be a thing for us. So what does our life look like now? But as I said, I, I wrapped it all up and, and kept it deep and then the blog allowed me to to exercise that to get it out and I can't say I have all the answers right now but what it allowed me to do was be a bit reflective it allowed me to to play with words because one of the things about this this thing for men is that you know we don't talk about our feelings I mean when do we ever do that mm. and so we don't practice the, of a, we don't have a vocabulary if you will to, to try and describe how we're feeling and so the blog allowed me to do that um, it, it was also a purging effect it allowed me to get some things out that I'd that I'd buried deep um, so it, it made me more courageous as well and that's where the clan of brothers comes in in that if I felt like that other guys must feel the same Mm -hmm. And so one of the big things that, that sits with us is that, you know, we, we absolutely try to avoid ridicule because <laughs> being a guy, you just can't deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, a, it's a bit like if you've got, uh, let's say, half a dozen men at the pub and they're all talking and, you know, that, that whole fishing story about, oh, yeah, mine was, oh, no, mine was that big. Mm -hmm. 
because everyone want, everyone every guy wants to be top dog that that's just the way they are in the group uh, and so the Clowner Brothers was around giving guys a safe space to to try and explore their own feelings. So we don't have the answers, but the way we've formed it is that together we may find them. And we're also realising there is a, is a depth of wisdom in this group that is allowing us older guys to mentor some of the younger guys who are just coming in. And so um, that's been that's been helpful for me uh, and I can't I cannot not mention the podcast because what that's done has allowed me to delve even deeper into the different aspects of what it means to be childless it has enriched my life in ways that I could never have imagined and it's it's also allowed me to say with confidence that I believe the childless community are the absolute gold standard in empathy. Like Sarah says, you'll never get a better, never get a better friend than a childless person. And that's because through something so, so traumatic, beauty has blossomed. Um, that's the way I look at it because we are so empathetic and so understanding of each other. And so um, reaching out to the community is something that is vital, vitally important. Now it's tough because we talked about it being socially, um, socially isolating, and it's a pity we didn't get de delve into that a bit more because our time's nearly up. But um, yeah, reaching out to community is is something is a, is absolutely a must in my book. Mm -hmm. Well, we started a little late, so if you guys are both uh, still happy to stick around for a couple more minutes and solve everyone's problems <laughs> in those five minutes um, because there is a question um, that came through in the chat that I'd like uh, each of you to have the opportunity to respond to um, that talks about the fluctuations in terms of those emotional experiences but also that thought process of you know it's okay I can still be interacting with children in different ways um, rather than necessarily having my own children and then oscillating to the other more darker emotions and thoughts. Um, and so she's asking, how do I keep the I will survive feeling consistent? Um, and is that, you know, I guess for me, I have, a, I think about, you know, is that, is that the goal or is it okay to have these fluctuations? Um, uh, in one's emotions or, or thought, thought processes. Um, maybe Sarah, you, you gave a response in the chat, um, but maybe did you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, look, um, I think the first thing I would probably suggest is visiting Visiting for yourself your thoughts and beliefs about what it means to be here and to be human and what it means to be alive. And sometimes we think, um, and this could be, you know, what this is what some people maybe want and this is really important, is this sense of when I'm feeling the negative feelings, when I'm... Um, you know, if I'm feeling sadness or I'm feeling whatever it might be that, that's really uncomfortable. Um, there's a couple of things about that. One of them can be um, it's, it can feel really painful. It can also feel that we, we may not feel confident in knowing how to hold the space and navigate those really difficult feelings. So it might be feelings of jealousy or envy or, or rage or anger or deep, deep sadness, or even maybe a sense of, of being quite quite sad and depressed. The first thing I guess I would say is that it's really good to have support, medical support, and also if needed, if there is something physiologically happening in terms of mental health, is, is to really get all of that checked out and to get yourself physically checked out, just to check that there's not a biological basis for really difficult emotions. The second thing I would say is that navigating difficult emotions is, 
is part of the set of skills that, that I work with, with women to learn. Um, and there's some beautiful work that's done, um, first of all, um, by some of some people like Brene Brown and, and shame researchers who really look at um, vulnerability and shame, but also goals in terms of, for some people, the goal is actually to be, to live in a very wholehearted way, which actually means being able to feel the whole range of our feelings and emotions and feeling quite confident in, and competent in, first of all, understanding what are those emotions, what are the messages that those emotions are giving me? Um, and I would suggest there's a wonderful book by a woman called Carla McLaren, who's a psychotherapist. Um, and she looks at the language of emotions is, is what her book is called. Um, so she will look at things like, for example, um, fear. Fear is a very natural emotion and fear is an emotion that comes up that says, hey, there's a risk involved here. You need to pay attention. And so the way that it's useful, as long as the fear hasn't flipped into something like anxiety, it can be very useful with fear to actually go, okay, um, this is something I need to attend to and I need to plan for this. So, for example, if, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a high-risk activity, it means I need to check my equipment. It means that I need to really it's sending me that message to prepare. Um, and it's similar kinds of the different emotions have very, you know, very solid messages, which is important to get to know. Um, the second thing I would say that, that certainly a good therapist will, will have the capacity to work with you to tend to and to navigate those difficult feelings. Um, and I guess the final thing that that I take from Brene Brown's work is that, that she talks about that you can't selectively numb emotions. And so if we start to turn the volume down on the ones that are really difficult, what actually happens is we start to turn the emotions, the volume down on all of our emotions. And that vulnerability, the vulnerability we experience from sadness and grief, um, that vulnerability is also the birthplace of creativity, joy, um, you know, about wholeheartedness and life. And so, so I guess what I would say is, is really get some really good supports in place for you and to learn those skills of being able to, to navigate those emotions. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I saw you also shared some details of uh, the Gateway Women community in the UK um, yeah. as a global community for childless women. Um, and Michael, you had also stressed like the importance of um, that community and finding your tribe. Uh, is there anything you would want to add, Michael, when Lambda talks about these um, emotions? Um, I'll speak from a personal perspective in that it was very important for, for both my wife and I to find a purpose because as I've talked about, it's a massive paradigm shift to, to living a life without children. And so, yeah, part, I guess part of the Clan of Brothers, the, the podcast, the, the, my blog is about, is about a purpose. Um, and, but again, what sits core, absolutely core in that is, is to find your community because it's um, yeah. Childlessness is very isolating in that that while everyone around you is is doing the normal thing, you're not. So as a coping mechanism, walls are put up to shield yourself from what's going on. But you'll find that those around you will also um, not quite sure how to deal with them. Mm. They'll they'll put you at arm's length and you you will drift apart and get further and further away to the point where you end up feeling like you're isolated in the world. That's not good for anyone. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I'd say find a community. That's absolutely, that's something you can do yourself and, and, you know, quite quickly. Because once you start, I found with my wife, once she started to normalise those um, feelings that she had and, and, she didn't feel so odd, if you will. You know, she she actually felt she started to feel normal because of everyone else is feeling the same. 
and um, that 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 that's you know, that was really important for us. Yeah. And when you did start Clan of Brothers, Michael, um, is is that what you found that you know people are you know there's there are all these people who are going through this experience, and so then did that group build up? quite quickly uh, or was it a bit of a slow burn um, for that community to build? Look, it was a slow burn because we're talking about guys now who, who need to feel really comfortable about um, where, where they're opening up. So what we chose to do was not so much focus on the problems that, that the guys had, but we, we, try to focus it on activities that we do together now that's that's complex when you're talking about people around the world online mm -hmm. so we would get to know each other through the things that we do so your hobbies um you know do you play are, are you into music do you mm -hmm. like cars you know we started to do things like that and that allowed us to create a basis for then that trust to, to develop and now we have um, we have a lot of guys sharing a lot of stuff that blows blows my mind sometimes in terms of how open they're being and how courageous they're being. Um, and I, the ABC piece really, really did um, uh, help us gather gather more brothers, as we say, um, because and the the common statement was I never realised that there was anything out there for us. Mm. And I am so grateful I have found this. I, I think without fail, every single guy in the group has said that. Mm. So it shows that it's needed. But of course, there's no research on childless men, or very, very little. I mean, Robin Hadley in the UK is doing a, in, doing a good job in China there. But apart from that, there's no actual research. There's no numbers that tells you how... You know, childless men be them in a relationship or be them single um so yeah we feel like we're groundbreaking we just um but at the same time it's we're discovering all this together mm -hmm. well i am that hour went by so fast um and I know this is just the start of the conversation here uh, in the UAE. And so certainly I want to thank the two of you for um, joining us today and for getting that conversation started and thanking our attendees for um, coming. Uh, and I think both of you touched upon some really important points. Um, and so thank you so much. Uh, let's see where this conversation continues to go. Um, and I know that you two will continue to be at the forefront of that, both in Australia and more internationally. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. No, thank you for thank giving you us the opportunity. Mm, thank you very welcome. Great. Well, thank you so much and have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you.